Happy Rusev Day everyone and welcome to No DQ video here on NoDQ.com and the YouTube channel YouTube.com slash Aaron Rift No DQ. Thank you for your viewership. It is much appreciated. If you enjoy this video, please share it. Please tell a friend. Anybody you know who watches wrestling, have them check out this video. Word of mouth really goes a long way. So if you can, just take a moment of your time and share this video with a fellow wrestling fan. Now with that out of the way, let's get down to your questions. First one today comes from DJ Birdie Booster, a longtime No DQ favorite. Hey Aaron, can you see Paige in the title hunt anytime soon? If so, do you think Alexa Bliss will turn face or will she drop the title to a face for Paige and her posse to feud with? You get brownie points for using the term posse. Paige's posse is way better than Absolution in my opinion. I think just about any name is better than Absolution. But yeah, I think it only makes sense with Paige being the leader of her own group to eventually get a title shot. And since they are a pack of thugs, whatever you want to call them, like the female version of NWO, they should be heels. And if Paige is going for the title, then naturally, Alexa Bliss should be the baby face. And I think Alexa could easily turn face and get over with the crowd. The fans already like her. I think it's an easy turn when it does happen. And yeah, Paige versus Alexa Bliss, if done correctly, sounds like a hot feud for 2018. We'll see if WWE plays their cards correctly and gives the fans a memorable feud between those two. I would definitely like to see it happen. This one comes from Cruz. This thing with Asuka and Paige, do you think it can lead to a one night only call up? Ember Moon and Kari Sane team up with Asuka for one night, similar to how Sasha got Bailey for Battleground 2016. Well, the thing about Bailey is that she pretty much was called up a month or two later. It wasn't like she showed up for one night and then disappeared back to NXT for six months. Um, I could see perhaps somebody getting called up after WrestleMania, but I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. And I would not do it. I would not call up anybody else right now. You just introduced five new characters to WWE's main roster. That is enough. Right now, WWE needs to focus on those five women, developing their characters, and getting them over with the audience. That is what WWE needs to focus on. They do not need to be calling up more women, even if it's a one-off deal. Ember Moon is the NXT champion. No need for her to be on the main roster right now. And Kyrie Sane, give her some time to establish herself. Yes, she did win the Mae Young Classic, but give her some more time to further develop her character. And NXT needs them. So no, I don't think you need to have anybody appear on the main roster right now, even if it's just a one-time thing. You know, it's going to overwhelm the mainstream casual fans because you're already trying to introduce them to five new characters at once, and that's a lot. Focus on the five right now, and don't, anything else would be overkill, in my opinion. This one comes from the No DQ Guy. With WWE holding live events based only for the 205 Live roster, is it a smart experiment to do knowing how low the attendance is already for the main shows and the low numbers 205 Live draws on the network? Is this doomed to fail? This is a great question. It's definitely gotten people debating about this, and I did talk about this a bit with Big Vito and Virtue and Jexy when we did Virtue's Rage. I think it does make sense to try. You have to try. You have to experiment. And WWE is trying to make 205 Live a successful brand. Now, how do you do that? I got some more questions here that I'll get to in a minute regarding 205 Live. But I think WWE is doing it the right way. They're starting off small, Mid-Hudson Civic Center and a few other smaller arenas to test the waters and see how the fans react to it. And will they show up? Is there enough interest to tour regularly 
Um, we'll see. Time will tell. If they can pack those buildings, then that's a good sign. If WWE can only draw 1,000 people to those shows, WWE may want to reconsider doing this, this extension of 205 Live beyond just being a television show. When as it is, WWE just recently surveyed fans asking them why they're not watching 205 Live. So is now really the right time? You would think that if 205 Live was doing awesome numbers, WWE would be like, hey, let's go on the road now. But 205 Live isn't exactly a hot product right now. So that's why you're asking the question and a lot of people are asking, why is WWE doing this? I think you know they're going to do it whether the numbers are good or not. They just want to test the waters and see if uh, they can draw any reasonable amount of people to these shows. This one comes from DJ K KGC. So we had DJ Birdie Booster and now we got DJ KGC. And he is a first time asker. Do you think Undisputed Era could rescue 205 Live? I feel they are more suited and they would draw in those needed viewers. Your thoughts? To be perfectly honest with you, I don't think so. Undisputed Era, those are Ring of Honor guys, Adam Cole, baby. They have a limited fan base. You know, it's more of an underground fan base. Ring of Honor appeals to your most hardcore of hardcore wrestling fans. It's like ECW. It has a cult following. Um, these guys have a cult following, Undisputed Era. They're, they're very popular with the indie wrestling fans, but it's not going to automatically translate into big numbers for 205 Live. Now, what counts for these guys is how you use them. If you bring them in, you give them a big storyline and they become interesting characters with an interesting storyline, then yes, they could potentially move those numbers up and get people watching 205 Live again. But just having them show up just based on their names, that's not going to be enough. It needs to be compelling television, regardless of which indie star WWE calls up to have them appear on 205 Live. At the end of the day, 205 Live will gain more viewers when fans have more of a reason to tune in than just guys doing matches. You got to have character development. You got to have interesting storylines that hook you, that make you want to tune in week after week. And 205 Live doesn't really have that right now. And one could argue that's what they need. They need to have larger than life characters and interesting characters that hook you and get you watching every week. And yes, there are some people watching it every week, but obviously not a lot if WWE is sending out that survey. But to answer your question, I don't think bringing in, bringing in Undisputed Era alone is going to really change anything. This one comes from Harvey. In order to help 205 Live and the Cruiserweight division, do you see or do you think having the Cruiserweights compete with other superstars would help fans grow emotionally involved with the Cruiserweights? Might also help establish them if given a few decent wins. This is another question that people have been asking about why hasn't WWE mixed the two different groups together having cruiserweights work with the bigger guys now there's the whole idea that a guy under 205 is not going to be credible against a guy who's 300 pounds there's that debate um, I would like to see more interaction though and a lot of people have been arguing that that's one of the problems that the cruiserweight division is its own little universe some people like it but some people think it's it's keeping those guys um, in a certain spot. There's a glass ceiling and they're beneath that glass ceiling being labeled cruiserweights. Um, just like Austin Aries, you know, he was a cruiserweight, but some would argue that Austin Aries should have been mixing it up with the big guys. Others feel it's not credible. So you have different theories, you have different opinions on it. Um, for me personally, I would like to see the cruiserweights maybe interact with the bigger guys, but I don't think a guy who's 200 pounds and 5 feet 7 or 5 feet 8 should be beating a guy who's 6 foot 4, uh, 250, 300 pounds. Um, it's just not believable. Um, so I, I can definitely see it both ways with the argument. Um, 
I think the idea of bringing in Undisputed Era is actually better. Um, they need some fresh blood. I mean, 205 Live needs some new people. They've been using the same guys for over a year now, you know, Cedric Alexander and Rich Swan and um, Drew Gulak and um, the guy with the abs. Don't even know his name off the top of my head. How bad is that? I don't even know his name. Tony Nese, that's it. Um, Tony Nese. These guys are great wrestlers, but they don't stand out. And it's been the same mixing of the same guys for over a year now. Um, every week I tune into 205 Live, it felt like the same five guys were being used every single week. Um, so yeah, I think bringing in some fresh blood and changing things up is a start and maybe having the cruiserweights. I think it's a combination of both. You know, try different things. Just shake things up a bit. You know, the same thing that WWE's been doing for the past year, it has gotten stale. And um, I think it's time to change things up a little bit and just explore some different possibilities with 205 Live and the Cruiserweight division. Moving on here now from Alex Suggs. With Matt Hardy becoming a Woken, I think it's just Woken, but a Woken is fine too. Will he get the biggest singles push in WWE he had since his feud with Edge in 2005? I would say there's a very good chance, and if this goes well, this could potentially be the biggest push of Matt Hardy's entire WWE career. And it is interesting to note that um, somebody pointed this out, that on the Google searches, you can check trends over the years, and you can enter somebody's name and see how many Google searches they're getting. And for the first time since 2005, Matt Hardy is getting more Google searches than Jeff Hardy. And this includes 2016 when the broken gimmick uh, got going. Um, so there is some interest in Matt Hardy doing this character right now. And uh, we'll see if WWE can capitalize on it. Um, it's definitely something that gives Matt Hardy some real momentum, which is something he hasn't had in WWE in a very long time. And um, I hope it works out for him. I hope that this is uh, the beginning of a big Matt Hardy push and not just his renaissance in wrestling, but his renaissance in WWE and maybe getting the big singles run that he never really got in 2005 when he had that momentum, but then it cooled off when he lost at SummerSlam and then got drafted to SmackDown. That, that was bad. I mean, Matt Hardy had so much momentum during that period and then WWE just... Uh, they, they basically blew it with him because they wanted to protect Edge. Edge was the next rising star. Matt Hardy wasn't in their plans. Um, so hopefully it's different this time. I don't know if that'll be the case or not, but we'll see. Hopefully he does get this big push and WWE keeps the momentum going. Got this one here from I'm a Mr. Penguin. Will Aleister Black win the NXT Championship, or will he just be caught up without winning the championship? I think you meant winning, but uh, winging it, or winning it, whatever. I could see him possibly winning the title if Andrade Cien Almas stays champion for a while, and what a joke that is. I'm still not a fan of that. I just feel like it waters down the title. I, I don't really take Almas that seriously as a world champion superstar, and once he gets caught up to the main roster, I, I don't see him going any further than Tyler Breeze has gone. I mean, I basically see him maybe being a lower to mid card superstar in WWE. Um, so I don't know about putting the NXT world title on him. I think that that is potentially a mistake and it waters down the title. I'd love to see somebody like Aleister Black get it. You know, I, I do think it's too soon for Aleister Black. I, I could see him being in NXT until maybe SummerSlam. I could see that as a, a realistic time frame for how much longer he's going to be there. So why not? You know, if um, Almas stays champion until WrestleMania, have Aleister Black win it uh, WrestleMania weekend in New Orleans and then have Aleister lose it right around SummerSlam and then go to the main roster. Seems like a nice plan to me. Got this one here from Smirtaza. Hey Aaron, what are your thoughts on the rumored Goldberg versus Batista match at WrestleMania 34? I don't think it's a good idea, but if this is the plan, it means Vince is not replacing Roman versus Lesnar with any possible dream match. Your thoughts? Where did you hear this rumor? Because this is the first time I'm hearing about this, so is it possible you just flat out made that up? Goldberg versus Batista? I don't think Goldberg's coming back. 
Goldberg had his comeback and it went about as well as possible besides a few little hiccups like slipping when he was trying to pick up Rusev. Um, for the most part, Goldberg's return was a huge success and if you saw that Goldberg 24 documentary, it took a lot for him to get into the Goldberg shape to do those short matches and he got to be the world champion at WrestleMania. That is the highest of high to be in a world title match with Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania. Um, what else could Goldberg do? What could be bigger than that? Batista, don't really see that as a bigger match considering the fact we've already seen it. I, I think Goldberg should just call it a career. He had his comeback, his son got to see him wrestle, and I think that's it. I don't think he's gonna wrestle again. So I'm not sure where you got that rumor from, um, but it certainly wasn't on ODQ.com. Um, I don't think we're seeing Goldberg again. Um, as far as Batista goes, I think I got another question here. Oh, and he said, um, he said vote for Cena versus Styles for the uh, match of the year, and also Great Balls of Fire for the pay-per-view of the year. Uh, but I don't think people are listening anyway, so they're gonna vote for what they're gonna vote for. But you tried. You gave the old college try. Anyways, okay, here's the other question I got about Batista from Joshua. With Batista in talks with WWE, that I can say is perhaps true. Um, Batista has said he wants to do a match with Triple H. But on to the question here, what are your thoughts on a possible Batista versus Braun Strowman match at WrestleMania? I like this a lot better than Batista versus Triple H. Batista wants to face Triple H I guess because he likes working with Hunter, but we've seen it before. I want to see Batista against somebody new. If Batista returns, I want to see him against a fresh opponent. Batista versus Braun Strowman is a fresh matchup. Batista versus Samoa Joe is a fresh matchup. Even Batista versus Roman Reigns, despite them having that finish at the Royal Rumble, that would be a fresh matchup even though we did see Evolution versus The Shield. But if Batista comes back, I'd like to see Batista against somebody he hasn't faced before. And even Lesnar, Lesnar and Batista, Beast versus Animal. I love it. But Batista versus Triple H, eh, big meh for me. Um, but yeah, I like the idea of Batista versus Braun Strowman. I'm, I would definitely approve of that. This one comes from Future Shocker. If you stand Randy Orton and John Cena up side by side, who do you think is the better all-around WWE superstar, best on the mic, most memorable moments, etc.? All right, I have to say Cena for sure. I mean, for me, it's it's a no-brainer. Now, Orton is not that far behind, but Cena is right up there. Whether you like him or not, he's in the top 10 greatest WWE superstars of all time. Um, as far as drawing power goes, I mean, you could argue he's right after Hogan, Austin, and Rock. Number four, biggest WWE draw of all time as far as mainstream appeal. John Cena does all these media appearances. He's doing movies. Although Batista's right up there too with his career. Uh, but Cena, Cena has really been a, a franchise player for WWE. Orton has been a big star, but not at Cena's level. So star power definitely goes to Cena. Promos definitely goes to Cena. In-ring skills, people can debate about it. Um, Cena has had a lot of great matches in WWE. CM Punk Money in the Bank and um, Cena versus Daniel Bryan. Cena's US Open Challenge matches. Orange had some good ones too. Orn versus Christian. Orange had some good matches with Cena. Some not so good ones. But yeah, I think in-ring, um, I would probably have to go with Cena. For me, it's close, though, when it comes to in-ring abilities. Um, I just think Cena has more great matches under his belt. Um, but yeah, you could argue you could argue either way with the matches. Um, and I think it comes down to your own personal taste. Um, you know, of course, people are going to say John Cena can't wrestle, yada, yada, yada. He can wrestle. It's just he goes out there and WWE tells him to do the superhero role where he... He sells for a long time and then, and then makes his big comeback with the five moves of doom. That's what WWE tells him to do. It's the Hulk Hogan template, Cena template, Roman Reigns template. So Cena is told to go out there and do a job. And he does it. Perhaps better than anybody in WWE history. I mean, that's the thing too. 
just as far as being a guy that goes all out for the company, I mean, John Cena's got to be right up there at the top. Orton, though, has definitely done a lot for the company, but Cena, I mean, that guy is a true workhorse in, in every sense of the word. This one comes from Mr. Yuck. Stemming from No DQ video 1021, instead of one guy turning on others, should the Shield all turn heel and feud with a face club? That's an interesting idea. I mean, on paper, I'm a fan of it. Personally, I like it. Turn the Shield heel again, all three of them. But we know that's not going to happen. Reigns is not turning. Again, Reigns is under that template, the Hogan Cena template. And WWE's not changing that. Ambrose and Rollins, maybe one of them will turn at some point. I, I, I think I've given up the idea of Ambrose turning face. I feel like WWE is not going to do that, or excuse me, heel, turn Ambrose heel. I, I really want to see it, but I'm losing hope. Every time I say this is a good opportunity, WWE doesn't do it. WrestleMania 34 is a great opportunity, but I'm not getting my hopes up. But to answer your question, I like your idea. Got this one here from Lester. What up, Aaron? What did you think about the Triple H versus Randy Orton feud back in 2009? And what the hell is Rusev Day? Really? What the hell is Rusev Day? Are you serious? You know what? Lester, you've just made the NoDQ.com, or should I say, the NoDQ video Hall of Shame. Shame on you, Lester, for even asking that question. I hope you're just trolling me. Rusev Day is the greatest day of all time. Today is Rusev Day. Tomorrow is Rusev Day. Every day is Rusev Day. Now, to answer your question, Triple H, Randy Orton, I thought the feud was disappointing. I think that's the best word to describe it. Orton had a lot of momentum when he punted Vince and won the Royal Rumble, but then Shane McMahon got involved and that was, that was the first negative strike on that feud. It cooled off Randy Orton. I wasn't a fan of the house invasion. It was a watered down version of the Steve Austin, Brian Pillman house invasion. WrestleMania 25 was very disappointing as a match. The one positive about that feud, I liked the angle with Stephanie when Orton took her out and Triple H had this angry look. It was great. Triple H had a great reaction to Orton attacking Stephanie. That was the one highlight of that feud. Everything else, for me, was very meh. That'll do it for this edition of No DQ Video. Thank you guys again for watching, and please spread the word. Stay tuned to more NoDQ.com content coming up this week and this weekend. Lots of stuff for you guys. Keep voting in the year-end awards, and maybe uh, take uh, the advice of uh, that earlier question, the suggestions. But nonetheless, keep voting. Please keep spreading the word, and I will see you guys next time.